Hello friends, you're with Gusto and today I am going to be eating the world's third hottest chili, the Trinidad Scorpion. This bad boy weighs in at 1.4 million Scovilles, but luckily for me, I don't have to do this alone. I'm going to be bringing back an old friend and hopefully some new friends too. I'm doing this to advocate for ME, a condition I have. And eventually, in episode 10, I am going to be consuming the world's hottest chili, the 2 million Scoville Carolina Reaper. Before that though, allow me to share with you the way in which the scientific research community is dedicating themselves to finding a cure. A lot of their work is made possible by the tireless efforts of charity and advocacy organizations, so it's important to highlight their efforts as well. There simply isn't enough research being done on ME. To give you an idea, here's a graph of how many studies are published each year worldwide for roughly similar conditions. While around 200 studies were published in 2013 on MECFS, in that same year around 4,000 studies were published on MS. That's nearing the same number of studies that have ever been published on ME up to that point, 5,000. So why is there so little study into the field? There are a number of disappointing reasons. The first is a chicken and egg problem. There's no definitive test to diagnose patients because we haven't yet discovered a definitive biomarker. Because no tests exist, research panels are rejecting crucial funding to discover the biomarker. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! Secondly, ME is highly stigmatized as a psychosomatic illness. As one researcher put it, we tend to underfund things where we blame the victim. Thirdly, when studies have taken place, Poorly defined criteria has added to the confusion selecting patients, making it harder to compare apples with apples. Another factor is that ME just isn't memorable. You could meet an ME patient, like me, without ever knowing they're unwell. And then there are the severely ill patients who so seldomly leave the house that they're practically invisible. Finally, most ME sufferers are just struggling to keep on top of their own lives making it difficult or impossible to advocate effectively for our cause. Even in my case, to make these videos, I have to sacrifice a lot of other activities that might be better for my well-being, like going for a walk, whipping up a home-cooked meal, or catching up with a friend. Despite the lack of funding, we still have numerous brilliant researchers who are staking their careers on solving ME. Here are just a few of the top names. Professor Ron Davis brings a strong personal passion to the field in the hopes of finding a cure for his severely ill son. Working alongside Ron Davis at the OMF is James Watson, half of the Watson and Crick team who won a Nobel Prize for discovering DNA. Professor Ian Lipkin, dubbed the world's greatest virus hunter by Discover magazine, has been frank in his assessment of how his research applications for ME, but not his other research, has been handled by the NIH, saying, I have been in competition twice now to get my ME research funded. And the people there who reviewed me gave me abysmal scores. And the critique of my work were unfair. And one of the people who critiqued my work said in fact that this is a psychosomatic illness. I was floored. I protested. And for reasons that are obscure to me, this same individual wound up back on the study section. And I got a similar unfundable score. Am I upset about this? Absolutely. Here's Lipkin taking the ME Chili Challenge himself alongside Manny Hornig, another crucial ME researcher. Unfortunately, those two are currently embroiled in a legal dispute over allegations of sexual harassment and bullying. So we can only hope that that is resolved ASAP for the sake of patients and all involved. Professor Sonia marshall Gradiznik and Professor Donald Staines. Woohoo, Australians! I'll slip an extra shrimp on the barbie for you. These two lead a team at Griffith University who are currently working to bring to market a diagnostic test for ME. I don't need to tell you how groundbreaking that would be for our cause. As a matter of fact, they've begun taking blood samples for one of their studies. And I'm not allowed to say whether or not I participated, but I did get my blood drawn yesterday for some reason. Dr. Oyston Fluge and Professor Olav Meller in Norway are currently running a game-changing trial using the off-label use of cancer drug rituximab. After an initial trial showed very positive results, the team are currently running a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized study of 152 patients who will all be followed up 24 months post-treatment. 
Results of that trial are expected late this year or early 2018. Drug manufacturers and researchers are finally starting to wake up to the potential behind this difficult yet fascinating disease, which makes sense. I'd pay damn good money for a treatment or a cure. Shut up and take my money! So what research developments have taken place? There's been some very good studies and some ultra bad studies. The good studies though have illuminated some interesting findings. Mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. These cells might be in some sort of hibernation state to preserve energy. Indications are that they've switched from burning sugar as normal to lower yielding fuels, such as amino acids and fats. Cytokine dysregulation supports the idea that MECFS may be some sort of inflammatory disease. Cytokines are substances secreted by the immune system which affect other cells. Patients who've had the condition for differing periods of time can show either too much cytokine activity or not enough. For example, prior to the three year mark, most patients have overactive immune systems, whereas patients after three years have underactive immune systems. In my case, I was a mild case of ME for the first two and a half years, after which I became a moderate case, which seems to fit that finding very cleanly. Exercise intolerance and lactic acidosis. Lactic acid seems to generate very quickly in ME patients' muscles and clear very slowly. Using this finding, a two-day exercise test proved reliable for diagnosing ME patients. However, it required patients to deliberately exhaust themselves two days in a row, making it extremely intrusive as far as tests go. Gut microbiome. Bacteria could be leaking into the bloodstream via leaky gut, which means it could enter other parts of the body, including the brain. There are some other less studied theories, such as mold toxicity, vagal nerve infection, allergies, diet, and heavy metals in the bloodstream. Let's talk about some of the bad studies. XMRV. In 2009, a study published in Science found that the XMRV retrovirus was present in a subset of CFS patients. Other studies failed to reproduce this finding and the study was later retracted in 2011. The PACE trial. Oh boy. I don't know if you guys are sick of hearing me talk about this on the blog, but it's very important I do because it was the biggest study at that point into ME, costing five million pounds, funded by the UK NHS with 640 patients, and it was published in the esteemed journal The Lancet in February of 2011. It compared graded exercise therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy against adaptive pacing. Graded exercise therapy means doing a little bit of exercise every day that you gradually increase even if you don't feel like it. CBT is a type of psychotherapy that helps a person change unhelpful or unhealthy habits of thinking, feeling and behaving. Adaptive pacing is doing as much exercise as you're able while staying within your energy envelope. That is, being careful to avoid a crash in your energy levels. The theory is that you can overcome your body's reluctance or your mind's subconscious fear of activity. Sounds like a good theory to the layman. However, the trial's flaws are so deep that even one of them should be enough to consider the trial compromised. Flaw one, selection bias. Using the Oxford definition of CFS. Six months unexplained severe fatigue. No other symptoms required. Exclude patients with neurological or cardiac symptoms. This definition is so loose that it can fit patients with depression and exclude patients who fit a more stricter criteria of ME. Floor two, objective testing using the six minute exercise test. Meaning that before treatment, you'd spend six minutes going under two miles per hour on a treadmill. This speed is so slow that it's something you'd expect a cardiac patient to feel comfortable with. After treatment, if you're able to go over two miles per hour for six minutes on the treadmill, you are classified as recovered. Floor three, recovery criteria changed mid study. Using their functioning scale, a normal person has a daily functioning of 85. If you enter the trial, you were required to have a daily functioning of 65. During the trial, recovery was redefined to 60, meaning you could get worse during the trial and still be classified as recovered following it. Floor four, conflict of interest. Dr. David Tuller summarized this best. The main investigators have had long standing financial and consulting ties with disability insurance companies, having advised them for years that cognitive behavioral therapy and graded exercise therapy could get claimants off benefits and back to work. Yet prospective participants were not told about any insurance industry links 
and the information was not included on consent forms. The authors did not include the information in the conflict of interest sections of the published papers. Further, a key PACE investigator was also serving on the UK government committee that endorsed the PACE therapies. All of this information was not acquired easily, mind you. The Queen Mary University of London, who hosted the study, spent £250,000 on legal fees to try and prevent the release of the anonymised data in the PACE trial. Even more staggering is that the Lancet still refuses to withdraw this flawed study, despite a strong petition with over 12,000 signatures and a letter signed by 42 leading scientists. Another alarming fact is that the same unhelpful protocol is being pushed on children with ME in the UK under the FitNet NHS program. This is the actual flyer for GPs to recruit patients. And here's the questionable statement. Most will recover at six months. Firstly, they represent recovery as an uncontested fact, yet this is a subjective definition as decided by the researchers in charge. Secondly, as David Tuller puts it, the leaflet is essentially announcing the result recovery before the trial even starts. If Dr. Crawley is so sure that this treatment is effective in leading to recovery, why is she doing the trial in the first place? And if she's not sure what the results will be, how is she promising recovery? Any suggestion that ME is a psychosomatic illness not only fails to help patients, it actively harms them. So how best do we fight against these injustices and support patients in the system? Well, that's where the patient advocacy community comes in. Let's have a look at who's sticking up for the little guy and continually pushing to find a cure. The Solve ME CFS Initiative. Founded in 1987, this is one of the longest standing charitable organisations dedicated to ME CFS. They advocate for and directly fund scientific research. Its president, Carol Head, is a former severe patient who has mostly recovered. So she knows how the people she's fighting for feel. She's a terrific asset to our community. Court Johnson. Court came down with CFS and fibromyalgia in around 1980. He created a blog in 2004 and subsequently the Phoenix Rising Forum, the most visited site regarding MECFS. Court continues to produce high quality blogs on the research developments and patient advocacy efforts in the field. David Tuller is an experienced public health journalist who wrote extensively to expose all the pace flaws. He's a top example of the kind of journalism our cause needs. However, even Tuller has been forced to turn to crowdfunding to support his personal quest against the PACE trial. Jennifer Breyer is an ME patient who I first encountered when I backed her campaign for her Unrest documentary. Unrest is currently screening around the world while Jen is touring to promote it. Jen has an excellent TED talk on the condition and she also co-founded the grassroots movement ME Action. Emerge is the ME charity in Australia, but are, as I've covered in previous episode, starved for resources given the neglect of my condition in this country. And to tell you who I'd love to see help advocate for our cause, any or all of the following celebrities whom I expect ME has personal meaning. Sure! Do you believe, believe, believe? Flea! Wish you saw. Emma Blackery was finally diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. Morgan Fairchild. It's because Morgan Fairchild has had this disease. And Stuart Murdoch. There's not even a, a bit of paper that says I have ME. But even if they don't respond, I'm still going to punish myself with 1.4 million Scovilles worth of Trinidad Scorpion. Wish me luck. Actually, before I do, do you guys remember Linda from episode 6? She said she'd return if the video got a thousand views and a hundred likes. Well, guess what? The people love you, Linda. Oh, no. Are you happy to be back? No, not really. <laughs> I can't believe that um, you signed up for this again, but congratulations to you. I thought it was going to be just a joke. We've got more guests joining us, so I want to introduce you to my mate, Tim. Tim, I went to school with, we've known each other over 20 years, and he was drunk one time and... <sighs> volunteered to join me. Yeah, and I instantly regretted it and I'm still regretting it. A worthy cause, but a stupid, stupid idea. And another guy that I met only recently is, is a new mate. Hey. This, this is Richard. Hey, how's it going? We only met a couple of times. Yeah. Like, 
Yeah, just a few weeks ago, and I was bragging that I can take chili, and uh, no regrets in it now, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, there's gonna be huge regrets in a second. So, yeah, yeah. bon appetit, guys. Cheers. 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 Ah, I can't do it. I can't do it. Whoa, one down already. Ah, one down. Oh, come on. Barbecue. Yeah, it's very smoky flavour. Yeah. There's a maniac. Ah, do this every day. <laughs> yeah, every time. <clears throat> Getting a bit hot now. Yeah. Yep. Back of my throat starting to uh, feel the heat. And the tongue. Oh, the only thing that's hot for me is the mouth. It, it didn't go down the hatch. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, people. Okay, well, Gus is dying. Lynn is handling it quite well. <laughs> this is 1.4 million Scobills. It's, a, it's a hot. My, yeah. I put Vaseline on my lips, and my lips are burning. Uh -huh. It's just a tongue for me. It's yeah. a really tongue, that's. Yeah. Tongue and the back of the throat. That describes it pretty well. <sighs> Uh, my, my body just immediately backed out. Sorry. It's going okay so far. Yeah. It's started so still something, but do I have a ventilator? Maybe you can uh, really handle your chilies, Richard. Well, we'll see in about two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Anything can happen. My nose is running and my eyes are a bit running. Gus is dying. I can't believe you do this every time. <laughs> yeah, the heart is racing. I'm getting hot. I want to take this off. <laughs> 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 Do we need to call the doctor? No! <laughs> just don't focus on it. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Just don't think, think about, about, think about milk happy things. And ice cream. <laughs> and the fires of hell themselves! <laughs> oh. yeah. It's warm though. I feel like, like I'm in a furnace. Yeah. Definitely. It, it, oh. it definitely hits Gus a lot worse than it hits you guys. Yeah. I'm getting a bit sweaty on my hands. Mm. Oh, the vision's starting to blur. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> You know what we need to do? We need to get more people with uh, ME or CFS and then give them the chilies and see if it's a, an ME CFS yeah. reaction. <laughs> yeah, no, a lot of people have messaged me. Thank you to the people who have. They <laughs> tell me, I'm glad you're doing it, but with my symptoms, no <laughs> effing way. <laughs> you're dying. You, you, your sweats are coming on. That's a serious thing. I feel like I go straight into fi fi fight or <laughs> polite <laughs> mode. And my body's like, hey, why don't we just jump off the building? It'll still be hot though, we did it. It'll still be hot as you go. Yeah, it'll be hot all the way yeah. down, so it's probably not gonna help. Mm. Uh, uh oh. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I just found a magnet on Linda's fridge. Dislike. <laughs> but look at these guys, they're fine. Yeah, it's I mean, fine. I'm but, regretting it. Yeah. Like, Maybe uh, I should do it. You guys look alright. Maybe I should join the game. Do it! Yeah, okay, go on. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Yay! That is hot. That's hot. Oh. Like it was. Oh, man. <laughs> Gas is not handling well. A five! <laughs> oh my god, it's hot. <laughs> round of applause for Deb. I'll give you a round of vomit as well if you like. <laughs> it's, not, it's not pleasant. It's not. No, it's really unfun, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I want one every, every day. Um, <laughs> as an everyday snack, Once a week. Yeah. Richard doesn't recommend, guys. And Linda again, just making us look like bitches. It's so hot, it's just silenced her. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh-oh. Yeah, can you guys hear this? <laughs> to anyone, you know, who wishes to do their bit for uh, MACFS, there's three of us here, and they're telling you it's really, it's not that bad. I it's think everyone hot. should do that. It's, it's hot. But do the challenge. Help out. We haven't even touched the milk. I kind of want it though. <laughs> Full power to you, Gus. But, uh, Thanks, brother. Well done, Gus. Uh, you're, a tri you're an absolute trooper doing what you're doing for the cause. Thank you. Job. It hits you hard. Now if we can just get some sweet ass celebrities involved in the deal. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Who would you want though? Sure. Sure is the number one person. It's sure? Yeah, she was, she was apparently touched by me. I'm going to cover all this in episode 10. You did have the biggest one. That's true. But yours yeah. was way bigger than ours. It's at least twice as old. I hear that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I can't stay upright. I just keep collapsing. Oh, God. And these stomach cramps are ridiculous. <laughs> well. That was pleasant. Uh, yeah. Should we do it again? Yeah, good time. <laughs> Tapping out. But it definitely it affected you worse. Yeah. Just, yeah. just a little. Just a little. <laughs>
Just a little worse. I'd say that's accurate. Yeah. So, <laughs> I want to thank these guys for helping me out. And um, thank you guys for watching. Uh, tune in next episode and we're, I'm going to cover how life with Emmy is set to maximum difficulty. Please tune in then guys. Thanks. Bye! <laughs>